Omagyanat Marandasya Kyanantana Shalakaya Chaksur and Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shanyavadi Paschachyadesha Tarine Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Tinamane Sri Varsavana Vidaivi Daitaya Kripadjaye Krishna Sambandha Vigyana Dhyane Prabhave Namaha Madhurya Ujjvala Premadhyaya Sri Rupanuga Bhakti Da Sri Gora Karana Shakti Vigrahaya Namastate Namaste Gauravani Sri Murtai Dinatarine Rupanuga Virupa Appa Siddhanta Dvantaharine Vancha kaupa tarubhyascha kripa sindhu bhai eva cha patita nam pavane bhyo vaishnavi bhyo namo namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So on this most auspicious day of the disappearance of His Divine Grace, Om Vishnupad, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, we will try to speak something of His glories. So, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Thakur was born, of course, in the family of a great devotee. His seminal father was our own Acharya in the Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya, known as Bhaktivinoda Thakur. And Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, he appeared as the fourth child in the, of, of ten children. Bhakti Minot Thakur had ten children. Bhakti Siddhanta was number four. So Srila Bhakti Minot Thakur's desire was to have children who could help him to spread the message of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu everywhere. And he, he was having producing children with that mood and bringing them up, raising the children that they would be devotees and they would help him to distribute the mes the message of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, uh, we're told from the very birth there were auspicious signs that this child was very powerful because at the time of his birth. When he came out from the womb of the mother, the umbilical cord of his mother was wrapped around his neck like a Brahmin thread. This was one auspicious omen. Then another auspicious thing which happened was because Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati was born there in Jagannath Puri, at that time his father, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, was uh, a magistrate in Puri, and he was overseeing all the affairs of the Jagannath Puri temple. So the family home w was right on the main road coming between the main temple in Jagannath Puri down to Gundicha temple. So the chariot would come right past their home. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur and all the family <coughs> Bhaktivinoda Thakur, along with his family, the children, would all come out to see Lord Jagannath and they would bring an offering. 
And because his wife had just delivered the child, so the child was passed up onto the chariot. And the system is the, the priests say, take the child and they place the child at the feet of Lord Jagannath. So Srila, this child who was going to become Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, he was placed at the feet of Lord Jagannath. And when he was placed there, the garland from Lord Jagannath fell off onto the child. So this was a, another very auspicious omen, indicating that this child is very special. So Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur took great care with all of his children, teaching them scriptures and preparing them to assist him in the preaching mission of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Another incident which happened in the childhood, which is very instructive for all of us, was that Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur had purchased some mangoes and he'd brought the mangoes and it happened somehow Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati as a young child, he had taken one of the mangoes. And when Bhaktivinoda Thakur came and saw that the child was already eating a mango, he told the child that, you know, this is not good. The mangoes are not yet offered. You have taken before, before Krishna. I brought the mangoes for offering to Krishna and then we would take prasada. But you've taken without the offering. This is not proper. So it is said from that time on, Srila Bhukta Siddhanta Sarasati, his whole life, he would never take mangoes. If people would offer him mango, he would say, oh yes, but I cannot take. I am an offender. So throughout his life, he kept that vow. This was a sign of his very strong determination and control over his mind and senses. So Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati grew up uh, got very good education, knowing many languages, and he was also a great scholar. He was very, very learned in astrology, and he did a commentary on the Surya Siddhanta. Surya Siddhanta is a book about astrology, and he had written a commentary on it. And when this commentary was seen, then an offer came from the Calcutta University asking him to take the chair and become professor, head of the department. But he was not interested in that kind of life. He didn't want just to be some scholar in a university, and he refused. Instead, he went to Mayapur, because Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur had constructed a temple at the Yoga Peeth, and somebody had to be there to take care of it. So Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, he went and moved, he stayed there overseeing the temple. And it, of course in those days the, the temple wasn't as it is today, it was much smaller and, and simple. And he would sit there and he'd taken, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati had taken a vow to chant m many, many uh, names of the Lord. And it was going, it required him to chant like 196 rounds every day for several years in order to complete this vow. So he was living there in Mayapur and performing great austerity. Sometimes he would just be chanting under an umbrella. Sometimes, you know, the building where you're staying, maybe the roof was leaking or there was no proper shelter. He would just sit under the umbrella and do his chanting. So he was very, very renounced and very detached from material sense gratification. Another thing which happened while he was still a young man, while he was studying, well, he's at college, he began, a, he began a society, he made a society uh, for practicing brahmacharya. Could you imagine 
encouraging people to practice brahmacharya, to accept the principles of brahmachari. In other words, not to get involved with the other sex. And he was successful. He got many people joining his program and they were interested to hear him. He himself, of course, throughout his life, he was a Naistika Brahmachari. So because he was a Naistika Brahmachari, Naistika Brahmachari meaning that his simon never flowed down. His simon went up to the brain. So he had very strong memory, very strong determination. And he could quote many slokas. Of course, Bhaktivinod Thakur had trained him as a child to memorize all the different verses from the scriptures, particularly Bhagavad Gita, he would know by heart, and so many other slokas. So when he would be involved in debate, he could present arguments very powerfully and very convincingly, and he could give a lot of evidence from the scriptures to support his arguments. And because he was Naistika Brahmachari, he was very powerful. He was known as Nashimha Guru. And the Mayavadis would run away from him. And he was very powerful in preaching against all things which were not in line with the parampara, such like what, what we refer to as Apa Sampradaya, teachings which are against the actual teachings of the Sampradaya. So he would denounce these kind of things. Things like uh, Siddha Pranali, giving Siddha Pranali to unqualified people who were neophytes in spiritual life. Siddha Pranali is a process where you're given a mantra and you meditate on this mantra and it's about your spiritual form in relation to Krishna and the spiritual world. So this is not, ex not, not a bona fide process of spiritual advancement. It's not accepted by the Sampradaya and he would be against it. Another thing he preached against was the monopoly of the uh, Nityananda Vamsas. Nityananda Vamsas are those people who claim to have a direct relationship with Lord Nityananda. And they claim that because of their connection with Lord Nityananda, that they should be the actual acharyas of the Sampradaya. But Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati pointed out that the right to preach is there for everyone, regardless of their birth. Just because they have some connection with Lord Nityananda, it doesn't give them the right to be the acharya. You cannot become the acharya just by birth. But the opportunity to preach and distribute Krishna consciousness is available everywhere for everyone. So Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati defeated all these kinds of people, all the different apasampradayas who were propagating uh, so-called Vaishnavism, but were just simply bringing a bad name to the Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya. And Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati established what is actually real Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya teachings based on Gyan and Vairagya, based on knowledge and detachment. Knowledge meaning, of course, knowledge of the scriptures and the Supreme Lord and his potencies. And Vairagya meaning detachment from all material sense gratification from anything which is not in relation to Krishna consciousness. So Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati was a very, very powerful preacher and he was very erudite, very scholarly. We can see, for example, when we read the Brahma Samhita, the Bhaktivedanta Book Trust have, have published the Brahma Samhita with the commentaries of Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada there. And we can see his scholarship and how erudite, the, the very high philosophical language which he uses to present Krishna consciousness. 
in, the, in his time, when he was physically present, sometimes scholars would come from the Western world to meet him, and they would be amazed that how, how scholarly and how erudite and the high level of his language. They would just be overwhelmed, and no one could defeat him, no one could argue against him. He would smash anybody who disagreed with his conclusion. So Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati was quite revolutionary in preaching. He was a strict follower of Rupa Goswami. Rupa Goswami taught Nirbanda Krishna Sambande Yukta Vairagya Uchate that everything, actual renunciation is to use everything in the service of Krishna, known as Yukta Vairagya. Not fogyo vairagya, not simply giving up everything, but yukta vairagya is utilizing everything in relation to Krishna. So Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati was quite revolutionary in the fact that he did things like he rode in a car. He had his car purchased and he would ride in the car and go to meet big people like the governor, at that time, India, in the times of Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, of course, India was ruled by the British, and there were people like, there were English people, like, the, in the position of governor. So he would go and meet them, and he even got some of them to come out here to Mayapur, to see Mayapur, and to confirm the actual birth site of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So he would use a car, because using a vehicle would create a good impression on these Western people. And another thing which he did was he would, he would wear sewn cloth. Now, traditionally, sannyasis won't wear any sewn cloth. They won't wear things like kurtas, which are stitched. They would just simply wear the cloth, the wrap of cloth around. But Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada, he would, he would wear sewn cloth and he would have a coat made and sometimes even he would wear shoes. And he would go to meet people, these big people, very important aristocratic people from the West, and he would impress upon them the nature of the Krishna consciousness movement. So it would create a very good impression on them. Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, of course, founded his own institution, which is called Godiamat. And as the founder, Acharya of the Godiamat, he had, uh, he had all of his devotees engaged in doing things like book distribution. Prabhupada used to say, he said, actually, everything he learned from his own Simeno father, he saw that his own spiritual master was also doing. You know, our own Srila Prabhupada, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, he was, he knew how to worship the deities, he was expert Madanga player and harmonia player, he knew Kirtan and he knew the scriptures. He knew cooking, how to, uh, how to cook nice prasadam for Krishna. But one thing which he learned, which his own Simeno father did not teach him, but which he learned from his spiritual master, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, was printing books and the importance of printing and publishing and distributing literature. In fact, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada he coined the phrase the Brehat Medanga, the printing press is the Brehat Medanga. Uh, the Medanga, the sound of Medanga can be heard for a block or one or two blocks, but the, the printing press, that sound can go all over the world. So Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, he liked very much to see books published and printed and distributed. And actually, in his time, he was publishing a daily newspaper. Every day he had a newspaper. Someone had said to him that every day he published a newspaper? 
nobody else does this. Why you have a newspaper every day? But Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada argued back that in Calcutta there are five daily newspapers. There are five daily newspapers with the news of the material world. But my newspaper is the news of the spiritual world. And the spiritual world is three-fourths compared to the one-fourth of the material world. So there's much more news coming from the spiritual world than in the material world. He said, actually, I could publish a newspaper every second, but there are no customers. So Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada liked very much to see the devotees, to see his disciples go out on book distribution. And if they could distribute even one newspaper, one newspaper which would be sold for just a few paisa, then he would be very happy, he'd be very pleased with them. It is said that when, they, when the devotees would go out for preaching, he encouraged them not to just only go to the wealthy people. And if someone came back just with a lot of money, he was not so much impressed. But if someone came back with some money and some vegetables and some rice and some flowers, he would say, oh, very nice, you've done very well. So he encouraged the devotees that when they go out for preaching, don't just go only to the wealthy people. Business is not just to get the money, but we want to get everyone engaged in Krishna consciousness. And if people could give some, a few grains of rice, or maybe a tomato, or some potato, or whatever, whatever they can give, then it's very good. They're offering something for the pleasure of Krishna. He liked that. He liked to see the devotees approaching all kinds of people. Another thing which Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada did was, if, when he would come to visit, well, he, with his Gaudiya Mat, he established some 64 centers around India. And he would go and visit the centers. And if he saw that the center had quite a bit of money in their bank account, then he would take the money and he would argue, he would build a pandal, he would build a, a diorama exhibition. Just like we have here in Mayapur, we have a diorama exhibition of Lord Chaitanya's pastimes. So Om Vishnupad Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada, he would take the money from the temple and he would organize an exhibition of Lord Chaitanya's pastimes. He would have some uh, sculptors come and create dioramas and they would have an exhibition. And the devotees of the temple, they wouldn't like it. They'd say, Guru Maharaj, you're spending all the money. We don't have any money left in the temple. But Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, he would say, oh yes, very good. Then you will have to go out and preach. So he didn't like that the temples would simply keep money build up a big bank account and have no, and then not go out preaching. He liked them to go out and preach. We heard also from our own founder Acharya Srila Prabhupada that the temple is not a place for just eating and sleeping, but it's a base for the army to go out and fight Maya. So Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada he liked very much to see his followers, his devotees, his disciples, that they should be active in preaching work. They should go everywhere, and preach and give Krishna consciousness. So, of course, one of the disciples of Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada was our own beloved founder Acharya, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada had met Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada, first of all, in the year 1922. And they met at a place called Utadanga, which is in Calcutta, in the city of Calcutta. 
We have purchased the property there now and they're making a small preaching center there. So, Srila, our, our founder Acharya, Srila Prabhupada, describes that he was not very much interested to go and see this sadhu. His friend was telling him, this sadhu is really good, you have to come. But our Srila Prabhupada thought, I've seen so many sadhus, they have not impressed me, I don't think much of them, I've never seen a real sadhu for a long time. But this friend of Prabhupada said, no, you have to come, this is really a sadhu, he's really a holy man. So anyway, Prabhupada was brought there to, to Uta Danga and he met, he walked, they walked in the room and at that time Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada was giving some kind of lecture, discourse to some people. And then we, when they walked in the room, immediately Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada looked at the door and saw these young men and he addressed them and he said to them, you are nice young men, why don't you give your life to the service of Krishna and preach Lord Chaitanya's movement? And Prabhupada said he was shocked. You know, this sadhu is suddenly addressing him and telling him, you should preach this message of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. You should distribute this message. You're a young man. Use your life for something worthwhile. Of course, Prabhupada said, he said, that at that time I was recently married. We had a young child. He said, I, I, I could not immediately take up the order. And initially he tried to argue. Prabhupada said he argued. He said, no, no, because our own Srila Prabhupada, he had become a follower of Gandhi. So when he walked into the room, he was dressed in the traditional clothes of the followers of Gandhi, which meant Kadi, Kadi, Kadi Kurta, Kadi Doti. And uh, Bhakti said, Kadi is a material, hand woven cloth, wo woven on the hand loom, right? It's very cooling, very comfortable cloth. Sometimes you can buy Kadi from the Kadi Bhavan. They have shops in India called Kadi Bhavan. You get this cloth made on the hand looms. And it's very cooling in the hot summer to wear. So Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, he was dressed in the kadi and he was standing there and Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati was telling him, you should give your life to spread Lord Chaitanya's mission. And Prabhupada said to him, well, our country, India, is not yet free. First we have to get independence for our country. This was the thinking of Gandhi and his followers, that they have to get independence first. But Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati was not convinced and he argued back, Krishna consciousness cannot wait for some political adjustment just to sim simply get independence. That's not going to change anything. Krishna consciousness is urgent. There's a need right now. Cannot wait for some just some change in government. We need to distribute Krishna consciousness now. So Prabhupada explained, he said he was defeated and he said he was very impressed. He understood that this man is really a powerful sadhu. He's really a great soul. So that was 1922 in Calcutta. But then what happened, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, yeah, he was married with a young family. And he, then he, later on he moved to Allahabad, he moved to Allahabad, now Allahabad is called Prayagraj. And he opened his pharmacy, he opened a business there called Prayag Pharmacy. And he was doing some chemical business there for some time. And it happened that while he was in his shop there at this Prayag Pharmacy, after, this was 1933, some Godiyamat people had come to Allahabad and they had opened a center there. So they came to, they would heard about our Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada and they came to meet him. 
And of course, he was very happy. He's Bengali, they were Bengali, they could speak Bengali together. And then Prabhupada explains, he said, oh, I, I've met this man, I know this, I know your guru, I know your founder Acharya, I met him before. Well, that was 11 years ago. But Prabhupada said, I never forgot him. So the Gaudiya people came there and they met Prabhupada and then Prabhupada started to go to the Gaudiya temple. And then 1933, he got initiation. Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati had come there to Allahabad and at that time they were reintroduced. So Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati initiated our own Srila Prabhupada, giving him the name Abhai Charanaravindam. Das, Abhai Charan, that's A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, called him Abhai Charan Arvinda. And he also instructed Srila Prabhupada that he said, you should read this book, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Rupa Goswami has written this book, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. It's very important. You should read it carefully. So, of course, we know Srila Prabhupada, when he went to America, one of the first books which he published was the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. He wrote his English commentary. And his English commentary was, uh, this was also another instruction which he got from Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati. That Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati had received a letter from our Srila Prabhupada. Actually, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati departed from the world 1936. So Prabhupada got initiation 1933, 1936, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati left the world. But before he left the world, Bhaktivedanta Swami wrote to him and said to him, he said, you know, I'm a householder I'm not able to do much to serve you. Because Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, you know, he'd established Gaudiya Mat. So in, in the Gaudiya Mat, there's brahmacharis and sannyasis. The householders, they're in their, their family life. They've got their greha, they're doing their work or some farming or business, whatever. They were not so active in the preaching. The preaching was all done by the brahmacharis and the sannyasis. So Srila Prabhupada wrote to his Guru Maharaj and said, you know, I'm a householder, I don't know how I can serve you. So Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati wrote back to him and told him that you're very good in English language and you should use your English to preach Krishna consciousness. You use your, your ability in this English language to present the message of Krishna consciousness. So that will be good for you and good for those who hear you. So that was another instruction from Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati. Of course, he'd also been given instruction at Radha Kund. At Radha Kund, because oh, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati had been donated a big temple in Calcutta, in Bhagbazar. They still have that temple. It's a very nice building, beautiful building. And... Uh, when they got that building, the devotees were arguing that this will be my room, I will have this room for my office, and they were all thinking about their own facilities. So when Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati heard about this, he was not happy. He said, better to sell the marble and use it to print books. And at that time he turned to Bhaktivedanta Swami, who was with him at Radha Kund. They were walking together and he said to him, if you ever get money, print books. So Srila Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, our founder Acharya, he remembered these instructions and he followed these instructions of his Guru Maharaj. You see the importance of the instruction of the spiritual master. Prabhupada kept them with him throughout his life. When they built the Samadhi, actually Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada, he left the body in Calcutta and uh, then his body was brought out to Mayapur to be placed in Samadhi, where Samadhi is just down the road from our ISKCON center. 
like the Chaitanya Mat. So his body was put there in Samadhi in Mayapur. But Srila Prabhupada was not very happy with the, the Samadhi. He, he said, they, they did not make it big. He said, oh, my spiritual master was such a great personality. They did not build a very grand Samadhi in his honour. He wanted a, a bigger, more impressive Samadhi and glorification of his spiritual master. Uh, so Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati himself, he was the seminal son of Bhaktivinoda Thakur, but he was initiated by Gorky Shodras Babaji. That is also a very interesting thing, that Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati is such a great scholar, so learned, and Gorky Shodras Babaji was practically illiterate. But Bhaktivinoda Thakur had told Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati that I'm your seminal father, I cannot give you initiation. You have to take initiation from someone else. But who is qualified? So Bhaktivinoda Thakur recommended Gorkishore Das Babaji, that that man, he is very good, he is very renounced. Bhaktivinoda Thakur was living here in Mayapur, probably over at Swarup Ganj, and Gorkishore Das Babaji would regularly come and hear the message of Bhagavatam from Bhaktivinoda Thakur. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur understood the nature of this uh, Gorkishore Das Babaji and he recommended him to be the Diksha Guru for Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati. And Gorkishore Das Babaji at this time, he didn't have any disciples and he didn't want to take any disciples. But Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati had come to him and begging him for initiation. So it was not until Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati was almost ready to give up his life that Gorkishore Das Babaji had agreed. Gorkishore Das Babaji was always delaying and saying, well, I will ask Krishna, let me see, I will ask Krishna. And then Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati would come and say, did you ask Krishna? Did, did you speak to Krishna? He said, no, I didn't speak to him yet. No, he didn't tell me yet. He didn't give me a reply. And so like that, he was always delaying, delaying. And then finally Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati said, if I cannot get initiation, then I'll have to give up my life. And then when Gorkishodas Babaji saw how serious Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati was to get this initiation, then finally he agreed, all right, then I will give the initiation. So it's very important, that commitment, that did very serious to accept the initiation and to commit oneself to the spiritual master. So Gorky Shodas Babaji, he initiated him, he gave him the name uh, and the, the name is one of the names of Radharani, uh, Varshavanavi Devi. Varshavanavi Devi. Dayitaya. Like that. Give him the, that name. That was his, at uh, the time of initiation. So Gorky Shodras Babaji had only one disciple, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati. But Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, he went out preaching and he made many disciples and opened with 64 centers around India and he also sent some of his disciples to Europe because he wanted that they should begin preaching around the world, not just only in India. He wanted they would distribute Krishna consciousness everywhere. And people went to Burma and people went to, of course, Bangladesh and people went to even Europe, to Germany, and then to England. And Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, he was maintaining them. He would send them money to maintain themselves. And some people even came. One, at least one German man had come to India and he'd taken initiation. So some success was there in the preaching, but not 
much. Nothing really serious was established. Some ladies in London had become interested and they made a little office, little preaching center, but there was nothing going on, no real preaching. So Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati was not so much impressed and he called them to come back to India. And so they came back to India, he brought the disciples back and uh, had them preach in India. So Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati was so much eager to see people from all over the world take up Krishna consciousness. He wanted to see Sankirtan movement go on, not just only Madanga and Kartals, but nice books, many books, many nice literature, colorful literature, well presented. Another incident relating to Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, uh, there's a temple of Lord, Lord Vishnu at a place called Al Alanath, which is about 30 kilometers away from Jagannath Puri. And Lord Chaitanya would go there to this Alanath temple during the time of the uh, rest of Lord Jagannath, when there's no darshan of Lord Jagannath, that period where Lord Jagannath gets sick and there's no darshan. At that time, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would go to Alanath. So this temple of Alanath, it's a Vishnu temple, very important. And Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, he renovated that temple and he wanted that temple renovated so eagerly that he had people come and roll beaties for the workers because he didn't like the, the workers stopping to roll their beaties. Beady means cigarette, little cigarettes that Indian people smoke. They're called beaties. So Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada, he had people come and roll the beaties for the workers so that they could work more, they could finish the construction and the renovation of the temple quicker. He had, he had this eagerness. Uh, so, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati uh, liked to put on big festivals. He liked to see crowds of people coming and take up Krishna consciousness. And he liked to see also people in saffron. I was hearing uh, Mahatma Prabhu, he was describing, he said one time Srila Prabhupada came to San Francisco and Prabhupada was entering into the temple at San Francisco and at that time the temple in San Francisco was full with all these brahmacharis and sannyasis. And when Prabhupada came there, he opened the door and he held the door open. He said, oh, I want my Guru Maharaj to see this. Because he knew his Guru Maharaj, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, he liked to see so much brahmacharis and sannyasis. He liked to see the men in saffron, that they were renounced. Saffron means renunciation, right? De away from the opposite sex. So he liked to see that. He liked to make, uh, he liked to see young men take up Krishna consciousness and dedicate their lives to it. The one time there was an incident, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati had initiated one man, and made him, had given him sannyas, but then the, the man's wife had come and taken him away. So Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati lamented that, he said, I could not save him. I could not save him. So this was, this was his mood in preaching Krishna consciousness. Uh, okay, so thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to speak something about the glories of Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada. Today is certainly very auspicious that he chose to depart from this world to return to his eternal Leela. So 
We are praying for his mercy, that he will be kind on this Krishna consciousness movement, that we can continue to distribute literature and build nice Krishna conscious centers. And of course we want to complete also this temple of the Vedic planetarium here in Mayapur. We want to see everyone, we want to make the whole world aware of Krishna consciousness. Right? And one way in which we can do it is by book distribution and building big temples, attractive temples that can also attract so many people to come. So Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati like to see some good propaganda work done on behalf of Lord Chaitanya's movement. So we're praying for him that he will please be merciful on all of us, that we can continue our efforts in this matter. Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Thakur Srila Prabhupada Ki or Premanande Haribo